thank you very much to EUI and Anna particularly uh, for making me part of this conversation and uh, what has already become, begun is promises really to be really engaging and let me see what I might really uh, add to that. Uh, I'm going to talk about, uh, the paper is there on the site, uh, and I'll just highlight a few things around three questions. Uh, some reflection on how does accommodation actually takes on, continues or occurs in India. From there to move on to how might we reflect about the possibilities of accommodation and the conditions of accommodation. And third, from there, uh, does it require that we reformulate the way we have posed and looked for answers to this question? And I'm going to begin by uh, an example, uh, an example that I'm taken from my own university. And it's about what happens, uh, uh, you know, during the holy month of Ramzan, fasting and prayers. Uh, in my university, we have no separate prayer rooms and there is no demand for any separate prayer room. There is also no demand for change of timetables and time off for prayer during this time or at any other time by other groups and communities. And uh, what happens during Ramzan is interesting because there is a little niche, a little corner on the sixth floor of the library where students just assemble for prayers who are in that vicinity. Others go to the mosque, some prayer in their rooms, some go to the terrace of the buildings, of the hostel buildings. And I say this, and you know, it is supplemented by a range of things. You can pay a little extra money and the special meal is prepared and served at the time that the, the, the practicing uh, Muslim members might want it to be so. The reason I give, I'm using this example is really to highlight uh, a, the contrast because uh, if one looks at issues that have come up in Western Europe, North America, there is continuously a demand. The scenario is entirely different. There are demand for separate spaces, for observance of religious practices, and ways of dealing with, not all religious questions can be settled in this way, but it seems those that can be, do get settled by looking for creating these separate spaces and zones where these practices really can be accommodated. But it doesn't happen like that in India. And I thought maybe the first thing to talk about then is that India has an elaborate structure, a legal formal structure for accommodation, but actually the challenges of accommodating informally, continuously, practices as and where they come up. So the next question to me was, why and how does that happen? How does this informal and why do people accommodate informally. After all, in my university, for example, there is no formal notification from the administrative heads or librarians have come and gone. But this has continued and it's become a kind of received practice. People know this is going to happen there. And why does that happen? And I, thinking about it, I thought, perhaps there are three things that we need to, one I would need to highlight here. The first is that, uh, and I should end mention, it's not only about Ramzan, it's about wanting to go for a holy dip in the Ganges and, or taking out a procession in the streets. These informal accommodations occur because somewhere along the line, religion and religious practices and beliefs are regarded to be different. Not only is d deeper and greater sincerity attached to them, but in actuality, when compared with other self-chosen affiliations and identities, this religious belief is regarded to be, is given a little more weightage. Not only, I mean, everybody recognizes that religious beliefs and commitments are of a different order. But the point is that here in these scenarios, greater weightage and sincerity is attached to the religious practice and belief, and therefore it trumps you are not compelled to make accommodation for somebody who wishes to practice football at a particular time. But you are compelled to make accommodation if a procession has to go, or a religious procession has to occur, or people have to congregate in a particular place. So that's the first element there, that religion is perceived differently, and it tends to trump uh, 
and is regarded as a very sincere form of affiliation and identity and tends to trump our commitments really to the other element. The second uh, element which has also contributed to this is perhaps the absence of a deep process of secularization. And I'm talking about its absence in relative terms when compared to what has happened in Western Europe or America, where you have, um, you know, uh, a history of conflict between religion and science, a history of conflict between the church and individual. And as a result of that conflict, there is deep suspicion about both community and about religion and most of all about religious communities, where they are seen as impinging upon individual liberty. And they have to be put in its place. So there must be a place for it, but there has to be a specific place for it. I'm not saying that uh, these tensions don't exist in India. They do. They do exist. But religion is recognized as a very central aspect of individual and social life. So there is still a kind of centrality accorded to religion, to religious ways of life. But there's a third component that has helped and sustained this informality or informal accommodation. And that is that the demand for accommodation of religious practices comes from diverse communities, not only from perceived minorities or recognized minorities, but also from the side of the majority. So it appears it's not something that only minorities are bringing into this society, into that society. And therefore, you know, you need to think about it differently. It is something that the majority also wants. They want recognition of their symbols, their practices, and they want space for that to be made in the public arena. So you have the majority as well as minorities seeking that. And these are the compulsions because of which people take that, serial, that religious affiliation seriously and at times, no, am I not saying that this happens all the time and because little things can trigger off just the opposite effect. But there is, as and when there is a possibility of accommodation that does take place time and time again. So the first point I wanted to mention, uh, make here is that uh, informal processes of accommodation, that's important. And they occur due to the centrality of religion and an assessment of religious beliefs in a positive way as being very central to individual existence. And this produces a sentiment or a willingness to, to um, accommodate. Of course, it is backed by a very elaborate formal legal structure uh, of accommodating and recognizing religious diversity. And I'm going to emphasize it's a framework of accommodating religious diversity and not merely a framework of secularism. So that's the second point I want to make. It is recognition and accommodation of religious diversity that is enshrined in the constitutional framework that has been the backdrop against which a willingness to make accommodation informally has been nurtured and sustained. It is true that India has, if we were to talk about secularism, not a rigid form of secularism which involves complete or a great deal of separation. It is closer to what might be called flexible or moderate or open secularism. But that has been only one element. And secularism in itself is not sufficient and is certainly not the ground on which accommodation takes place. Uh, it facilitates some of the time, but it's not a sufficient condition in, in and by itself. I say this because even the most moderate and flexible form of secularism is able perhaps to give weightage to different religious communities alongside. But as and when there is, a commit, there is a conflict between a religious practice and individual liberty, it has and it always sides on the, uh, supports the side of individual liberty. And I think this is a characteristic of most understandings of secularism everywhere. <clears throat> 
And I'll give you just two examples, one from India and one outside of India. When in India, you have, we have plural personal laws. You, we have uh, community-based personal laws, so in all matters relating to family, it is the community personal law that prevails. And secularists in India have been concerned of the status of women in these personal laws. For a long time, there was a, the secularist commitments or uh, people who supported the secularist framework wanted reforms or changes uh, in the personal law so as to provide equal status for women. And if you look at, in the US, the time release program for religious study, one of the challenges that came up really was that what do the other students do at that time who do not want, whose parents don't want them to have religious education? And eventually the Supreme Court felt that if it puts too much pressure on the non-believers to conform, then this program must go. You must find some other form of accommodation. So my point is that secularism at the end of the day can make some accommodation to bring in or some aspects of accommodation of certain kinds of religious practices uh, alongside other religious practices. But when there is a conflict between religious practice of any group and community and individual liberty or equal citizenship, it sides with the latter. And if we look at the kinds of claims that are coming up from religious communities everywhere, they are not seeking merely that they be given the same facilities as another religious community. They want really their belief and practice to be recognized and accommodated as being important to their identity, to their being. And this is why I wanted to emphasize that perhaps accommodation has occurred because in India there was initially a positive recognition and accommodation of religious diversity, so which is something slightly different from merely endorsing a framework of secularism. Recognizing, accepting, and accommodating a religious way of life has been accompanied by two elements. One is, of course, an evaluation of the place of religion in the individual life, a positive evaluation of that, and second, is understanding the religious way of life. And I want to emphasize the term understanding here, because we've talked very often of accommodation in terms of tolerance, and I want to shift the discussion from tolerance to understanding. Because tolerance, as we know, is usually being making space for that which we might not ourselves be willing to accept, which we may find uncomfortable, even repugnant at some times. But that's about it. So it allows you to make space for that difference, but only some of the time. And one is only to look at the number of times we find this, and I'm not going to give an example only of the most talked about minority, the Muslim minority, which always comes up in these discussions. But let's say about the Sikh community, the number of times uh, Sikh men have objected to their being asked to remove the turban at the airport security. And surely these are people who are willing and tolerating this practice. It's not as if they don't tolerate and find this an offensive practice. They tolerate. But that's my point, that it gets things right some of the time. But inadvertently, very often, tolerance can be accompanied by uh, actions which actually are seen as being uh, offensive to the recipient. Because it just doesn't understand why is it that is that this turban is not merely a mark of identity, but also a symbol of self-respect and dignity. And this is something we need to understand about what does a religious identity and mark really imply? And what does it really stand for? So understanding is the element that I would like to emphasize and uh, you know, talk about. And understanding to me implies, in other words, not only understanding a religious way of life, notions of what are sacred there, but also recognizing, uh, and perhaps beginning with the starting point, that there may be some rationality behind the action and try to uncover that 
me, and rather than merely tolerate, because you never enter into any discussion or dialogue with the other when you merely tolerate. Uh, with the little time that is left, I want to just flag three other issues, uh, and I'll just flag them uh, here. The first is that when we are thinking in terms of accommodation, uh, one needs to recognize that uh, politics matters. It's important. We can't merely be thinking about a particular principle which is going to provide us with a solution. Uh, part of uh, both evaluating religion, being placed within them, and or a person being placed within them, or understanding this other, is an ongoing process. It is something that has to be taken on all the time, and continuously so. And therefore, there is never a single principle that can really settle matters once and for all. And if you want informal accommodation to take place, particularly, then politics matters. The role of the P person, the government, the person in charge in that particular situation, they make a crucial difference. The second point uh, that I want to link to this and emphasize is, therefore, we need uh, multiple kinds of strategies to deal with and create space for accommodation. There could be you know, uh, uh, strategies involving challenging stereotypes that are created. But on a more positive side, we need strategies which are willing to recognize the positive contribution of different groups and civilizations to a present world and modern sensibilities. And this is not just the creation of a single group, whether it is science, technology, or anything else. We need to think of this. The third element is something that, in the paper I mentioned, I'll just say that something that I started thinking about uh, based on an article that Biku wrote many, many years ago, where he said that accommodation requires some adjustment on the side of the majority as well as the minority. Uh, without going into details, i just say that a majority needs to be cognizant of the presence of the other, think in terms of positive uh, assessments and contributions that others have made to our present predicament and ways of thinking. On the side of minority, we need a way of being true to one's beliefs in a way that is also comprehensible to some extent, at least, to the majority. And I gave an example that I came across recently of a concept called Seva Day that was celebrated uh, by some communities where the notion of service in a community was reinterpreted to imply service as might be regarded uh, comprehensible to the larger majority of what, how do you give back to the community. And I will just end one sentence is in terms of uh, what I say towards the end of my paper, and that is that we need, therefore, to think in terms of multiplicity of practices rather than a principle of accommodating and nurturing religious diversity. At the level of ideas, one needs a framework of thought that emphasizes not just the moral, what is good for the individual, but of the ethical, that is action that we arrive at and in which we arrive at what is desirable in terms of living with the other. At the level of government, one needs uh, a positive desire and willingness to recognize religious diversity and to live peacefully with others. At the level of the individual, one needs the willingness to open oneself to the other, to the humanity of the other. And I want to really say, it's not merely about being hospitable or to the guests who are here, but really opening yourself to the humanity of the others. Thank you. Thank you.